Why talk about money at all? Why, on a Sunday morning, would you make people feel really uncomfortable by messing with their wallets? I want to illustrate why I think this is so important. I've got a few reasons we're going to run through, but I want to illustrate it. I just want to show you this. I have more attention now than I ever had. Your attention again. If I just keep holding this up, y'all, hey, it's just an interaction. Nice it is. I'm going to put that away because we actually have something new to that. Why talk about money? Well, the Bible spends a ton of time talking about how believers should think about money, how they should use their money. Why talk about money? Because in the church, what we understand is what we think about money often reveals our heart towards God. It reveals what we think about God and how we trust Him. Why talk about money? Because especially for our culture, we are bombarded daily with advertisements, with worldviews, intent on convincing us that bigger and newer and better equals content, equals happiness. Why talk about money? Because when our, when our hearts and our wallets are fully aligned with the will of God, we experience joy and security, the joy and security we desire. That's what the Bible puts forth. But how powerful money is to derail us, and how powerful it is to direct us towards God. Some of you, as soon as we started talking about money, got really uncomfortable. This is none of your business. This is between me and God. And there is truth to that, in the sense that you will stand before the Lord with how you stewarded, how you used, how you managed your money. That's totally true. And yet in the New Testament, we see Paul and Jesus talking often, and in the Old Testament, talking often about money and how it can be used for God's glory and for the, for the saving of souls. Some of you in this room, as soon as we talk about money, almost feel like we just twin to shame. If you knew how I used my money. Some of you are very skeptical. You've been in churches that talked about money, and here's the 40 minute hard sell to keep the lights on. <coughs> what I want to do today is I want to look at a parable uh, that Jesus, Jesus told late in his ministry in Matthew 25. I want to use that parable to illustrate a larger point about, about what we have from God. And then I want to kind of narrow it down to really what that means for our money, and I'm going to give us some applications. So we're going to look at the broad implications of this parable, and then we're going to narrow it down, because this is the first week of about three weeks where we're going to dive into, and what does Scripture say about money? This week uh, has to do with, man, how, how do we manage, how do we steward what God has? Next week is debt, and the week after that uh, is our generosity to help bring and breed faith in our lives. So, Matthew 24, or 25, 14, through 30, as, as we get into the parable of the talents, and right before the parable of the talents, there is a parable of the ten virgins, and it, it's where Jesus describes what it will be like, or how, how we should live before he returns. Because Jesus uh, says, you know, I don't even know the hour, only the Father knows the hour when I'm going to return, but I will return. So when I leave you, Know that I'm going to return, and so here's how you live. And so the, the, the ten virgins are, are a great example of what it looks like to live ready, to be watchful, to live as if Jesus was coming home, coming back today. That we would waste no opportunity. That Christians wouldn't be the ones saying, oh, I have another day. I can do that tomorrow. Right after this parable of talents is a famous discourse where Jesus describes what judgment day will be like, where he says, you know, on one hand I'll have the sheep, on one hand I'll have the goats, and the sheep will go to eternal life in heaven, and the goats will be separated in eternal, uh, eternal separation in hell. That there is, there is this, as you read through this, these last chapters, there is a palpable urgency that Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to come back, and you need to live in a way that reflects that, that I can come back at any time. That there needs to be an urgency about the Christian life 
where we leave no opportunity wasted. And this gives us, this puts us into Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Let me put the main point up in front. It's this. How we manage God's resources matters deeply to God. That as we, as we begin to tease this out, what you're going to see is that God is, is keenly aware of what he's given us. And he desires us to use it well. Matthew 24, 25, 14 through 30. Follow along in your copies of God's word. Verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the first five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more talents. So also he had two talents and made so also he who had two talents made two more. But he who had one, who he who received one talent, went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, uh, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. And he who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. And to the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what is yours. But his master answered, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has to him. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness, in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. To understand how this parable kind of ties in to, to money and, and all that. We're, we're going to look at four key observations, four key observations that will help us understand and apply this text. That there is a ton here, it's, it's pretty long, so I'm going to walk us through four observations that when we understand, we will fully get this text. The first key observation is this. The servants were given the master's property. The servants were given the master's property. Verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted that to them his property. Uh, he starts off by saying, for it will be like. This is another example of a parable that, that is in the context of Jesus' return. The parable before was about how to live in light of Jesus' return. He's saying again, for it will be like this. It's the same motif where Jesus died, he rose again, four days later he ascended to heaven, and he's saying, there will be a time when I come back, but I'm going to tell you how to live in the interim. This is the time we're living now. He said, he called the servants and entrusted to them his property. Uh, entrusted is a, is a verb there that describes giving over everything he had to the management and the stewardship of the people there. One of the things important to understand here is that the servants... Everything they received, none of it was theirs. Nothing the master gave the servants was the servants' permanent. Nothing you have is yours. No money, no job, no talents, no gifts. None of them is yours. It has all been entrusted to you by the gracious uh, we often use a word called stewardship, and it's a, it's a biblical word that needs some definition. Stewardship is managing the resources of God for his glory and the expansion of his name. Stewardship is managing the resources of God 
for his glory and the expansion of his name. That as we, as we begin to kind of unfold this parable, uh, the, the master gave everything to these people and, and, and to these servants and entrusted it to them and made them managers, made them, made them uh, basically delegate the authority to them and said, listen, I've entrusted you with this. Take care of this. It's not yours. You don't get to do what you want with it. That entrusting it meant they had to know who the master was and what he would normally want to do with that. What are the resources of God? Well, it's the money we have, it's the abilities and skills, it's the status we may have in the community, it's family, friends, it's the intelligence that we have. And a lot of us think, you know, I, I, I'm so smart and I've earned that. Well, did you create your brain? That was given to you. It was designed by God for a certain purpose. You stewarded it, that's great. Everything we have is God's, and everything on the earth is God's. Psalm 24, 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That there's nothing in the Lord surveys that is not His. There's nothing you have that is not given to you that is still His. We are stewards, we are to be managers of what He has given us. Stewardship is managing the resources of God for His glory and the expansion of His name. In other words, as we've been given, as we've been given this, there is an intent to our management. We are to manage things, not how we best think, but according to what brings God to glory. That's the intent. And the aim of that, the aim of that, let's go to stewardship, a definition back up for Carlos. The aim of that is the expansion of his name. We've got the intent is the glory of God, and the aim, the way that we accomplish that is the expansion of his name. That we use our families, we use our resources, we use our money, we use our time, our talents, our gifts, all leveraging them to bring glory to God by expanding his presence all over the world, all over our communities, all over our houses. That is how we steward what God has given us. With regards to money, as we kind of, kind of narrow it down here, stewardship is not focused on not spending, but it is focused on spending rightly. The stewardship often has this connotation of, oh, well, I, I can't ever have a coffee. Well, I can't, I can't ever have a nice car. Does it mean you can't have a coffee? Does it mean you can't have a nice thing? Does it mean you can't buy the good bacon from Lucky's? Stewardship, here's the thing. Stewardship as the Bible presents it requires thoughtfulness as opposed to never thinking about it. That we don't get the luxury as Christians to say, you know what, I won't think about what God has given me. Uh, I know that in marriage, money is one of those things that is just a clash and, and it's difficulty. But we as Christians don't have the luxury of not talking. Stewardship also requires self-control as opposed to impulsiveness. You can have something in one hour, you can have something in one day, you can have something in, in two days, but it happens on Friday. If it takes longer than that, you might as well be shipping it from Africa. Like we're just, like, we can't have it now. Well, stewardship requires self-control. Stewardship also requires, there are, there are moments of self-denial. And this, in a self-indulgent culture, that says you should have what you want, the way you want it, when you want it, it runs in the face of that. But stewardship means there are going to be times where we deny ourselves what we think we want to better steward the resources to give God the glory. Stewardship requires a slowing down before speeding. In other words, stewardship requires you to know, okay, this is what God's given me, this is how I'm going to use it, and you create a plan and you use it. But there is no, there's no plan in Scripture for kind of making up how we steward God's gifts to us. The servants were entrusted with a lot and were expected to do something with it. The second observation is this. The servants received what they were able to manage. The servants received what they were able to manage. This will be one of our least favorite observations. I'm just let me know. Verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. So he goes and he entrusts to them uh, his things. And to one, one servant he gives uh, five talents, which is, each talent is roughly in our money today, about $9,000. He gives $45,000 to one servant. He gives $18,000 to another servant. He gives $9,000 to another servant. He says, each according to his ability. He looked at servant one and says, yeah, I know his competency, I know his skill level, I know, I know that I can trust him with this, and so I'm going to give him more. He looks at, at this one and says, I know his competency level, I know his skill level, I know his gifting level, I'm going to give him uh, 18,000. Okay, servant three, I know his, his competency level, I know his skill level, I know his ability level, I'm going to give him 
9. That, that when we understand that God has created us all equal, that doesn't mean that all of us have the same abilities, competencies, or gifts. The master did not give equally, and that was intentional. The master gave as he saw fit, according to the abilities of his servants. Not everyone has the same gifts, not everyone has the same competencies, not everyone has the same skills or abilities. And yet everyone, each of the servants, must be faithful with what is given to them. But we understand this to be true. If we put a high schooler over here, we put a college student right here, we put a married couple, mid-40s over here. Which one of these three are we going to give $45,000 to? <laughs> Not the Fortnite playing pizza eating, still living with his parents back. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving you $45,000. You high school students. I got, we're going to put it over here with the married couple, hoping their, their experience, their prudence, and life uh, will lead them to use that well. well are we gonna, where are we going to put this $18,000? We're probably not going to give it to the Fortnite, whatever it is over here. We're going to give it to the college student. They're going to spend it on student debt. Uh, and then we're going to give the we're going to give the high school student nine thousand. We recognize that not all of us have the same capabilities, the same gifts. This this rails at us though, because in our in our sin, uh, it's easy to feel cheated. And yet God in this is concerned with faithfulness, not fairness. God is concerned with you being faithful. He's not concerned with being fair to you as you understand fair. That God is concerned with faithfulness, not fairness. And if you're the third, if you're the third servant, all of us have been the third servant at some point. It'd be easy to look around and think, maybe God really doesn't love me. Or he's wrong with me. I feel cheated by God. Because I don't have what that guy has. It's easy to look around and say, man, I wish I had a wife like that or a husband like that. I wish I had a job that would pay me enough or a boss like that. Or I wish I had a house like that. I mean, God really hasn't been good to me because I, I can't get a house. And God has wronged me in that. Here's the thing. Discontent will always lead to anger, which will always lead to jealousy, which will always lead to bitterness towards God. Discontent with what you have will always lead to envy, will lead to jealousy, will ultimately end up in being a bitter mess towards God. That, that part, of, part of doing what God uh, designed us to do with what he's given us is a heart of gratitude. Being a faithful steward requires a gratefulness with what God has given to us, not bitterness, gratefulness, and not discontent. We look around and say, okay, this is what God has given me. My job is to be faithful with where I'm at, with who I am, with what I've been given. That this is what God has given us. And God then expects us to manage and be faithful First observation was that the servants were given the master's property. They didn't earn it, they were given it, and it was still the master's. The second observation was that the servants received what they were able to manage. It wasn't about fairness. The Lord, the master looks at them and says, I know if I give this person, they'll manage that, this person will manage that, this person can manage that. Third observation the master expected faithful management of his property. The master expected faithful management of his property. Verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received, that's always dangerous when there's two really positive things and then the word but just shows up. It's a train wreck is coming. But he who received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. I love, I love this first servant. Uh, he went at once, the text says. That the master just left. We don't know when he's going back. But the, but the first servant loved his master, knew his master, knew his responsibility, and went at once, didn't delay. And said, this is what the master's given me. I want to go today, and I want to, I want to do something that will increase his, his property. I want to do something that will profit my master. The second guy goes, uh, and he says, he made two more. That's a, that's a Greek word for investing, that he went and found places to invest so that his master could have positive reward. Now, here's the note about this. The first two do very similar things. The first thing they did was they both did something that had the possibility of producing increase for the master's property. You guys said that they went and did something that could potentially create more for their master. The second thing is by doing something, 
they both were at a risk for potential loss. That the first guy who went right away to the market and started trading, he could have lost a couple talents. The guy who invested, the second guy with the two talents, could have gone and they could have lost that. Yet they knew their master, they knew his character, they knew his desires, and they thought it best to risk it. They knew the train wreck servant. He dug a hole and hid. Which, if I had $9,000, doesn't seem like a terrible idea, I guess. There's no chance that that money is going to get lost if it's in the hole. There's no chance of someone stealing it. There's no chance uh, that, that the servant could squander it in reckless living. It's totally protected. That the servant did, did something to protect that wealth, but guaranteed there was no chance of gain. That he did something that guaranteed that the master would have no chance of gain. The focus, uh, as we get to this parable, and I want you guys to understand this, is not the outcome. It's not, it's not the five talents that produce five more. It's not the two that produce two. It's the action and the trust of the servants that, that kind of fuel that. That this third servant, as we're going to see, regrets what he did and ends up, and ends up regretting it because his view of God was wrong. That he did that because he didn't understand who God was. He didn't understand, he didn't understand his master after years of having Managing God's resources requires faithful effort. That is, what we've been given is going to require us to assess what we have in talents and gifts and skills and abilities and money and family and status. All these things that have been given to us by God. We have to decide what, what we have, and then we have to make the decision, how are we going to leverage this for the glory of God and for the expansion of the gospel? These are the two most fundamental questions for every Christian. What do I have that's been given to me, and how can I glorify God and expand his name? This is what good stewardship is. But it requires us making a faithful effort, which means this is the scary part. Which means it's possible that even in attempting obedience, we might fail. Because remember, servants are not praised for the outcome. They're praised for their obedience. Not praised for the outcome, they're praised for the obedience. They're praised for how their faith prompted a, a, a faith taking risk. They're not praised for the outcome. God has given us everything we need in order to accomplish all of these good works. Ephesians 2 10 says this For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice, nothing you have, your friends, your family, your money, your car, any of that, nothing you have is by accident. But you've been given what you've been given. So that before, so that you can do the works that before time God has already prepared for you for. That you have everything you need in money, you have everything you need in resources, you have everything you need in talent in order to steward these things well. You don't need more wisdom, though that's helpful. What you need is more faith to risk stewarding and obeying God. That takes wisdom and discernment to be sure, but you don't need anything you don't have. That God has given you exactly what you need in order to to go and be obedient. In other words, what God has called you to, what God has called us to, he has equipped us and empowered us for. That he has not called you to climb Everest unequipped. And he said, here's ten shirts. And here are some, I don't know how you climb Everest, I don't know What he's called us to do, God has equipped us and empowered us for. To steward his, his stuff, his property. The fourth observation to understanding and applying this parable is this. The servants are held accountable for their faithfulness. The servants are held accountable for their faithfulness. First servant, in verse 19. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came, and this is the return of Jesus. This is uh, what's kind of portrayed here. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward Bring five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Get this, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. The second service also, verse 22, second servant. And he who also 
And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered me uh, two talents here, and I have made you two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. I love this. This is, this is a beautiful picture of when we cross over into eternity. That Jesus looks at what he's given us, how we've stewarded it, and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the rest to the joy of your master. That's a, that's a phrase to talk about heaven. It says, and he's, you've been faithful with little, I'll make you faithful with much. He's pointing to eternity. He's saying, listen, I, I put you in charge of, of this amount in your life, and you stewarded it well, and it was for my glory. In, in eternity, I'm going to put things in charge, look what you in charge of things in heaven. In other words, heaven will be similar to the garden where we'll have good work to do, to steward creation, to give God glory through obedience, to, to relate to him, that what we are, what we uh, what we do in this life has eternal impact in the next, which is why we get to the third servant and we're so wondering, wondering why he did this. Verse 24 says this. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what, here is, what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. And notice this question here in verse 26. It's meant to be a sarcastic question. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered no seed? Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers at my coming, and at my coming I should receive what was mine. What he's saying is, I'm going to call you on your life. Because if you really believe that, if you really believe that I was a harsh master and a, and a guy who was going to destroy you, you would have at least put it in a place where you would get interest. But you didn't even do that. You did something that was so, so self-protectionistic. You guaranteed that I wouldn't lose anything, but you exposed your heart for what it is. This, is, this was very common in the ancient Near East and in Jesus' time, but also it's common in our own hearts. But we believe, uh, as children of God, as redeemed children of God, that God is still waiting up there to laughably smile us. But if we just make one mistake, if I just do one thing wrong, that capricious, fickle, angry God is waiting to destroy his children. If that's your view of God, Christian, it's no wonder why you don't have the faith to risk sin. That is not the God of Scripture for the Christian. If there is therefore now no condemnation, the children, children of God do not faith his wrath faces wrath anymore. We faith the discipline of God. And so when we risk and fail, we don't get the wrath of God, we get the loving discipline of God. We get, we get, the, we get the, the error of our own ways, the, the consequences of our own We don't suffer the wrath of God anymore. That's, that's past. And so if you think, like the servant did, that God is wrathful and angry and, and waiting to destroy his children, you're not going to risk anything either. And this was the core issue. The core issue wasn't the talent. The core issue was the heart of the two servants who knew their master, understood them, and were willing to take the risk because they knew the character of the master. Over here, the, the, this one servant who didn't understand the character of the master, who was afraid of him, who was sure he was going to suffer his wrath, thought, if I can just save myself by keeping this money, I, can, I will be spared eternal separation. That the actions of the third servant, his inaction, exposed his lack of faith and lack of love for the master. The first two servants loved and had faith in the master. And this is primarily why this servant is cast out of the darkness, into the national team, into eternal separation. But we know that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. That you cannot earn salvation. That you cannot say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recognize that God has given me this, and I'm going to steward it as well as possible, but I'm not going to trust Jesus for my life. I'm not going to come and say, you know, uh, I'm broken, and the only one who can save me is Jesus. Uh, that you can't, you can't get to heaven by good works or good intentions or any of that. But what we do see here is that how we manage our money, how we manage the, what, what God has given us, exposes our heart and what we believe about God. That if we, if we believe God to be capricious, fickle, wrathful towards his children, waiting to destroy them, there's no chance he looks. You will, you will step out of faith. And there's really, if this is your belief about who God is, misunderstood God. If you understand as a Christian uh, that you are saved by grace alone through faith alone, and that, that even in your good intentions, you're going to mess up and there's grace to cover that, you're going to risk it. 
Because you know the master up there isn't waiting to smite you. He's not waiting to strike you down. He's waiting to direct you and waiting to, at the end of your life, say, welcome, good, faithful servant. Managing God's resources has eternal impact. For the faithful servant, there is a reward in heaven for faithfully mastering, faithfully managing the, the, the master's resources. God's not expecting perfection. Uh, as we talk about what God has given us, God's not saying the standard is you better do this perfectly, and if you can't do this perfectly, you are cast out of the outer, dark, outer darkness. That's not the standard of Scripture. That's not the standard of salvation. It, it's a welcoming do this. Here's what I've given you. Start asking this question. Start finding ways to give. Start finding ways to live in ways that matter forever. How we manage God's resources matters deeply to God. This was the main point at the very beginning. How we manage God's resources matters to you. This is the main point. Let me, let me ask you to write something else right below this for taking notes. How we manage God's resources matters deeply to God, and it should matter deeply to me. Just write that down. It should matter deeply to me. That we should be a people who are thoughtful, who have self control, who take time, who, who know what God has given us, and desire to bring God glory and expand His name with all of these gifts. The Christian should be marked by that. It should matter deeply to us because it reflects our trust in Him. It should matter deeply to us because it reflects how much gratitude we have for what He gives us. It should matter deeply to us because it reflects how we actually know or understand who God is. It should matter deeply to us because it prepares us for eternity. How we use, how we manage God's resources matters deeply to God and it should matter. So that's the, that's the kind of overarching principle of that, uh, of that parable. That God has given us things to steward, to manage, and he has said, be faithful. So I want to just narrow that down just for about the next six minutes, seven minutes, about finances. Where does this start for us? How do we start making change? Let me offer you three different, uh, three different ways to start making change. The first is uh, make a budget. I didn't make my first budget until uh, Vanessa and I were, were married, and I can remember our first fight was over our first budget, which is like every budget. I mean, this is, it's, we talk about budgets, and okay, I have a budget, but when's the last time you revisited it? When's, when's the last time you measured how well you're doing? If you don't have a budget, and we talk about managing what God has given you, it's impossible to know where it's going if you're not delineating. If you don't have a budget, your money is controlling you. That it's determining where you spend. A budget says, okay, I've got this money, this is where it's going, and this is how we're spending it, I'm gonna track it. I, I was surprised, I was surprised to find out how, how few people have budgets. And then and yet how many of those people have issues with money. Part of this is just a simple dollars and cents equation. How do we how do we know what we have so we know what we can spend? If you have a problem kind of making a budget, don't know where to stop, start, let me just offer this to you now. After this, after this. This session, go right up to the bank and sign up for financial peace and peace. We have a class dedicated to helping you budget and get out of debt. And we have Carl and Andrea Daggett, and they're like superstars like this, who are non-judgmental and they will love you and have been successful in this. You don't have to, you don't have to wonder how to make a budget. We'll help you. And we'll help you store what God has given you. Uh, make a line item for giving in that budget. A lot of a lot of as I encounter things in in the past, a lot of people say, I'm having trouble giving regularly. Well, well, how are you setting aside? Well, whatever's left over, God gets. After I get my cold brew, cold foam, pumpkin spice latte. After I get my Lucky's bacon, or the organic kale, or whatever it is. Like, it ends up being, whatever God gets left over, that I don't spend. That's not tithing, that's tipping God with what's left over. And it's, you're robbing yourself of the joy of being challenged by faith. You're robbing yourself of allowing God to move in your lives. So get a budget. If you've got a budget, ask yourself this question. Does this budget reflect efforts to manage God's money for His glory in the expansion of His name? If someone looked at your budget that you've been creating and monitoring, would people say, man, this budget seems like it's, it's different than everyone else's? Does your budget look like the same person who you work with? Or is it, can, can people tell from the numbers and how you spend your time and your, how you spend your money that you are dedicated to expanding the glory of God in His name? The second thing I want to challenge you to do is to start giving regularly. Giving, the, giving in the Old Testament was a 10% tithe. 
which meant that, that they lived on 90% and 10% gave, gave, uh, gave, was given to the Lord. In the New Testament, we don't see a percentage attached to that. It says, we want you to be a cheerful giver, a joyful giver. Here's something you need to know about the Old Testament and the New Testament. What God requires in the Old Testament is never lessened in the New Testament. He doesn't require us to do less in the New Testament. He actually requires more of us in holiness, but we have the Holy Spirit and wisdom and discernment that the Old Testament saints didn't have. He requires more of us. It's harder, but we get Him living with us. And so as we think about, uh, we think about this 10% thing, 10% should not be the ceiling that we think of. The ceiling should be whatever God calls us to, whatever God decides for us. As you, as you think about you, your church, where you call your church home, where, where do you do your ministry? Where, uh, where do you join mission with They should be the primary recipient of that money. And that sounds great. Well, that's what the self serving pastor said. That's the truth. We don't ask that. Like, he said, well, you know, churches are always asking for money. And you know, we don't, we don't ever think about that like Netflix. Netflix is out to get my money. No, you give it over for the binge watching, right? When you go out to eat, you don't say, man, Applebee's is out to get my money. Well, no, you go there because you have a need. The question is, do you need the church? And has the church provided spiritual nourishment? Has your family been encouraged? Are your kids being grown? Have you been counseled? That's really the question here. It's not, we don't need your money. God, God doesn't need your money. The question is whether or not you're willing to put your money behind what God has given you. If you're already giving, I have a challenge for you. You already give. I want you to pray this prayer over the next three weeks. Lord, all I have is yours. I give you permission to increase my giving. Now, he doesn't need your permission, but it's helpful if you just give it to him for your heart. Lord, all I have is you. All I have is yours. I give you permission to increase my giving. And look, no one's going to follow up with you. And after three weeks, you could be like, you could look at your budget and say, you know, I feel like we're giving just as God has asked us to. Praise the Lord. That is awesome. But after three weeks, you could be led to not just feel, or someone could come to you and say, will you support me going there once in a while? Or what? That there are opportunities that God desires for you to use that money for his glory. If you're married, don't make this decision without your response. If you do that, you'll be in my office for marriage counseling and weeks ago. And do that together, husband and wives. Number three, attack debt. Not all debt is created equal, but all debt hampers generosity. If I went to every person here and said, do you want to be more generous? Do you want the opportunity to pay for that single mom's groceries who was in front of you and, and didn't have enough cash? Do you want to be able to support the mission of God uh, in, in the far reaches of uh, the Amazon or whatever, do you want to be able to leverage what God has given you to see his name and his glory expand? All of you would say, yes. There's, not, there's no one here who would say, nah, I'm not in that. Like, that would be strange. What we know about debt is it hampers generosity. It slows down our ability to, it really chains us to, to the lender. The debt is, or the debtor is a slave to the lender is what the lender is saying. So listen, pay it off aggressively. Ask yourself this question. What could you do for the Lord with an extra $150 a month? What could you do for the Lord with an extra car payment a month, an extra $300 or $500 a month? Imagine, imagine how generous you could be if you weren't chained to that debt. And what if you somehow paid off your house in less than 30 years? What if you had an extra $1,200 a month? What could you do for the Lord with that? If you want to know how to roll back debt, go on sign up for Financial Peace University. We've got people in this church who have shed tens of thousands of dollars of debt just by getting a budget and being disciplined. And you'll, be, you'll be surprised how easy it is to be generous. Actually, I told the story in the first service. I was in a missional community our first year here, and we, our missional communities do projects in the community to help, uh, to help really expand the name of Jesus. And so our missional community uh, had this project with, uh, with a local lady who, who just got a drug rehab, and her kids needed Christmas. Now, I don't know if I've told this story before, but we were out at Walmart. The men went over here and were shopping for clothes, and the women went shopping for toys, and I don't know why. We had to switch that, because it wasn't working. But I, I can remember, deliberately, we had this budget. We had all given some money, the church had given some money, and we ran out of money. And as the men were like, we need more stuff, because we were getting into it. It's fun, it's fun. That's great, it's great fun. 
And we, we can see, man, they really need these other things in the list. I'm like, well, I'm like, well, I was back, I was back, now. we're out of money. And another, another man who, who's in the church who, uh, and who have really, didn't really thrown, thrown themselves into getting out of debt, and they're not people of extreme means or anything like that. He pulls out a stack of 20s. He's like, I got this. And he starts to do on 20s now. And we bought, we bought toys, and we bought, uh, I don't know, 15 or 16 things that we didn't have planned because this guy had gotten out of debt and wanted to spend it to that family. I have never been so much more attracted to the joy of giving than that moment. It's, it's, it's this beautiful thing when you're free to do that debt handling. That's what's happening. I play games with it. I tag it for the glory of God. Listen, when we manage, when we manage things well for the glory of God, we'll end our time on this, our tenure on this, or the work that Jesus comes with. They'll say, well, I'm good for this work. And to the joy of your master. That's the goal. God, we are grateful for all that you've done. God, we are grateful for all that you've given us. God, we confess that sometimes we have been discontented. God, that we have looked and envied and, and been jealous and, and moved to bitterness with you about not having what we think we should have. So God, we ask that you would give us uh, clear eyes to see what you've given us, God. That you would give us grateful hearts for what you've given us. And God, that you would give us uh, the faith God, to push into obedience, to use what you've given us. Money, God, family, and all the other areas of our life. That you would give us the courage to move forward, to give you glory and expand your name to the, to the far reaches of the world and the far reaches of the world. For your glory and our joy.